Hi, everyone. Um, so welcome to this uh, panel, Financial Inclusion in Mature Markets panel. Um, I have to say I'm quite excited to be moderating uh, everyone here today. Uh, and my three panelists, I'll uh, look to introduce them very quickly, but they'll be much more, much sharper and more interesting when they when quickly introduce themselves. But before that, I wanted to just give a bit of context about sort of wh why, why there is this focus, uh, wh why the subject of this panel today? Why is it <clears throat> that we're looking to speak, that we think it's relevant, that we think it's important at this moment in the dynamics around the world regarding um, uh, financial inclusion? Why we think it's important to speak about inclusive finance in mature markets and more specifically, taking a quick look at what are the most um, exciting, pertinent, uh, eye-grabbing innovations in, in, in three mature markets that are France, Japan, uh, and the US. And, and how can we take these as examples that if we, if we pull the string, the string, it will show us uh, the opportunity that's there and, and unfortunately, in inverted commas, growing from, um, from a financial inclusion need. So, Usually when, when we speak about financial inclusion, what comes to everybody's mind is very much the, the emerging world. Um, but what's for sure is that there are lots of points in common, first of all, in terms of the, the emerging and the mature world. The first are, is obviously that the products and services that are available, financial products and services that are available to low to middle income people around the world naturally tend to be expensive, quite difficult or unadapted in use. And um, it's clearly insufficient when it comes to meeting the, the financial needs of these populations. Also, these needs are changing and they're not necessarily changing for the same reasons uh, across both categories, let's say, of countries which are mature and emerging. But, but it's, it's leading to the same output or conclusion, which is the needs are growing and the, the addressable population that we're looking to protect is growing albeit again for different reasons. So we have needs that are sh shifting, as we know, due to, 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 demogra to demography. Sorry, it was a wrong, wrong tonic accent on that. So be it aging populations in some countries um, or very young growing, growing youth populations that are, that are coming out of poverty, that are increasingly educated, et cetera, and, in, and entering the, 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 the labor market in a different way. But it's also, so beyond these demographic shifts, you have the changing nature of employment uh, the changing nature of work, uh, and we're seeing that across both mature and, uh, and emerging markets. So what we can say, and this is what we'll focus on now, is that typically, and, and, and social protection has been born, was born, in mature markets at least, because they've relied on employers providing, employers providing a work contract, providing a salary, but providing some degree of financial inclusion, so to speak, or social protection, more specifically when it comes to insurance, but beyond that, even in terms of financial services through, this is, this is, this is a variety of services that's provided because of the work or thanks to the work contract. Um, we can go beyond, right? In, beyond insurance, it's pensions, it's retirement savings, it's healthcare. All of this is provided through the work contract and the changing nature of work means that these services are no longer um, easily or readily available for, for a, a growing amount of workers. So as you can imagine, I'm going to now immediately speak about the digital wave, or I think we, could, we should stop calling it a wave, but maybe even an ocean, because it has an important role as ever uh, to play when it comes to inclusion and, and not only financial inclusion, by the way, but health inclusion, uh, gender inclusion, education inclusion, uh, nutritional inclusion, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm not going to share numbers. I had written down here in my notes uh, uh, numbers that have come out from a few studies uh, by, by strategic consultants regarding how, how much uh, the COVID era has accelerated digital adoption. Um, but suffice it to say that this wave of digital adoption or ocean, so to speak, for the underserved in emerging but also in mature markets, what does it mean? for this underserved population? And how, how is it going to really help overcome hurdles that are faced by these low income and or underserved uh, populations? And I think our three panelists are really going to aim to answer that question specifically. Um, can it 
can this digital approach or adoption or uh, wave adoption, can it help existing incumbents overcome challenges they've had so far? And actually, will this wave overcome the incumbents or is it going to play with them uh, alongside them or in complementarity with them? And I think that the, the last point that is going to be the, let, the red thread also of this discussion is what lessons can we draw across developed economies and actually cases that can be inspired and i'm sure our three panelists will tell us that they have also been inspired to a greater or lesser extent by emerging economies who as we know and as i and i started the, this quick introduction to have had to ask themselves this question for many years now so i'm garance what is richard I, I i lead the axa emerging customers so the inclusive insurance business of, of the axa group uh, uh, one of the leading insurers uh, in this world. And thanks to Action, uh, thanks to Action who organizes this yearly financial inclusion week that's getting more and more sophisticated, actually, in inverted commas, uh, really more and more action oriented. Um, when I see the agenda uh, for this week, it's, it's, and that's already started, of course, yesterday, it's, it makes me not want to miss a minute uh, and to actually find every, every, every way I can to spend the week listening to, the, to, to this Financial Inclusion Week. Um, thank you again, Action, for having us here. Uh, I really think it's the right time right now because I was going to go on because I thought that what Sophie Sirten from SIGAP yesterday pointed out uh, during her keynote yesterday was, there are several points she pointed out, but let me get back to that at a later stage because I would really like to have our, our panelists um, introduce themselves now. So. I would like to start with uh, Marie, Marie de Grand Guillot. Uh, I was going to start uh, more or less uh, <laughs> reading your bio, but I think it's more, it's more important for you to, to maybe introduce yourself quite quickly and then I'll ask uh, Rachel and, and Tejan to, to do the same. Great, thanks, Garant. Hi, everyone. So I am Marie. I am uh, living in Paris currently, so uh, it's just after lunch. I'm very happy to be with you. I'm the deputy CEO of Nickel. And Nickel is a fintech providing a current account uh, to more than 2.8 million cl clients now. And uh, and uh, it's very much we are very much active in all those uh, subjects uh, as uh, such as uh, financial inclusion. Before Nickel, I was in an, in the NGO world working in microfinance in mature markets as well. So uh, there are many things I guess to share in this panel, and uh, very happy to be with you today. Thank you, Marie. Uh, maybe Rachel? Sure. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Schneider, and I'm calling in from New York City, where it's this is my first conversation of the day. So if my voice sounds groggy, that's why, as I, um, <clears throat> I'm just waking up. Um, but I've spent um, a lot of my career thinking about financial inclusion in the US. I, I worked at the Financial Health Network um, for many years and led research there. And, and I'm sure we'll talk about one of the projects that I led there called the US Financial Diaries. Um, and a few years ago, I switched into a, a more active doing mode around this work, which is I launched a startup called Canary. And what we do at Canary is we facilitate the transfer um, and decision-making around small-ish cash grants, um, which I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about the role that cash grants play in financial inclusion. And I'm delighted to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And I know one question I have is, is who are these cash grants to? But if I understand correctly, it's to employees. And I actually think that's a, that's a very interesting angle because when we think financial inclusion, I think a lot of us think, you know, special status, unemployed or, you know, non-salaried or gig or contingent and so, some form of new way of working. But we, we don't always think that actually just your sort of classical boring BAU employee uh, yeah. very often is in, in dire need of being a, a better financially included. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, Tejun, uh, also known by his best friends as TJ. And, and oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, please. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me again. Um, I'm in Japan, so it's uh, 9 p.m. now. I'm a little bit sleepy. Um, so uh, I, I co-founded the uh, company called Gojo, which is a holding company of microfinance institutions in uh, Asian countries. Right now, we are working in five countries, serving 1.4 million households. Um, 
So the, uh, it is running as a for profit. We are planning an IPO in a few years time. And just recently we noticed that as a for profit organization, it's extremely difficult to serve the lowest income households in developing nations. So we founded the foundation and I committed my shares um, to run the foundation. I'm the largest um, the, the shareholder of the company. Um, aside from my work at Gojo, I had run my own nonprofit for 15 years. So I started my company eight years ago. So my nonprofit activity um, started even earlier. And what I was doing was to support children in you know, foster uh, parents or under poverty and their parents in Japan. So um, I spent 15 years with these children and mothers especially. So um, I, I think that is why I'm here today and I thank you for having me again. Thank you everyone. So I think I'd, I'd love to kick off the discussion and of course, please ask, ask your questions as we go along. And, and as we were saying before, all together when we were preparing this panel, I think uh, what would be great is if we each uh, or you each rudely interrupt each other or no, politely interrupt each other if you really have, have something to say at that point and not necessarily, you know, wait, wait till the end to say it. I mean, again, I think uh, I, I, I would have loved to have a survey, a poll of the audience who decided to join this session because they saw the word mature. Because I think uh, probably uh, as a collective sort of cohort, a lot of us think emerging as soon as the word inclusion uh, comes along. Um, and but in a way, sadly, uh, we're starting to realize that it's 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 also very much a question uh, for for mature markets. Um, I would have, I mean, I can give you a, a little bit of data, but I'll let Rachel probably talk about uh, the the percentage of households in the U.S. that are actually underbanked. I think it's reached something like fifteen percent. And what does that mean? Is that you know maybe they have a bank account, but they use very expensive alternative services right next to that because they're not able to use it in an optimized way so is it money orders check cashing etc i know in in france marie has a lot of things to tell us about the people who are financially vulnerable which i think is four and a half million but marie will tell us more about that and that that isn't just a number like that that's been done by a study it's like a regulatory status and it has quite quite strong impacts, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to start with you, uh, Rachel, uh, because I think that everything linked to financial diary, at least for us, all of us here, and probably a lot of people in the audience, is, is really what makes, um, what makes things move forward. Uh, it's probably one of the most constructive approaches, if not the most constructive approach, I find, and a lot of us find, I think, to, to, to putting, obviously, these people in the center and really better understanding what they're doing. So uh, by zooming, obviously, on the US, what would you say are your main learnings? Or, or as we say in French, le rapport d'étonnement, which is you started out by doing something and you were not expecting at all to see that. So for example, us when we looked in AXA at France, we weren't expecting to see that 18 million people earned between 60 and 90% of the median revenue. I wasn't expecting that at all, for example. So I would love to hear from you on that. Um, and then if you have a specific uh, angle, obviously uh, following the COVID or more recently the inflation uh, crisis impact on uh, financial inclusion challenges. Yeah, of course. I'm delighted to um, help us get started here. So, I mean, as you pointed out, um, even in the U.S., we have a significant number of people who are on or underbanked. So the most recent numbers that the um, FDIC reported were that 5% of Americans are unbanked entirely. Um, they stopped tracking underbanked, um, but nonetheless, we have uh, good estimates about, around that. And, and the and 5% doesn't sound very big. So I think that that makes people think, oh, well, this isn't an issue in the US. But the fact is that the numbers vary really significantly when you dig under the top line number to specific demographic groups. So among black Americans, it's 16% of people are unbanked entirely. Among Hispanic Americans, it's 14%. And then if we look at the underbanked percentages, we see the same disparities and the numbers are about twice that, right? So 30 percent ish of black and Hispanic Americans are underbanked, which means that they're, as you pointed out, using banking services as well as other services. And amongst the white population, that number is 14%. So we still see, you know, pretty significant numbers of people who are 
operating their financial lives um, in meaningful ways outside of the um, regulated bank industry. Um, of course, underbanked services are also regulated, but they tend to be more regulated state by state. And so there's bigger variation. And part of the motivation to do a study like the financial diaries was let's get underneath that number and understand what's actually happening. Like why are people staying, um, continuing to use informal services? And more importantly, like what's happening in their financial lives more broadly? Like we wanted to be able to understand how financial inclusion connects to act deeper financial outcomes. And a lot of that impetus was happening in parallel with the movement in the US to, to really switch from thinking about financial inclusion as the goal to thinking about financial health as the goal. So um, at the Financial Health Network, we had been looking at on an underbanked statistics for years. And you know, the only reason to care if somebody has a bank account really is what are the financial health outcomes they're achieving? Are they saving enough? Are they secure in the instance of an emergency? Are they able to think about the future in an effective and productive way? And what we saw in the US was even though the unbanked numbers were relatively low, but the percentage of people considered financially healthy were also fairly low, right? So um, really about a third of Americans are, are financially healthy, um, roughly, a third, and then there's this big chunk in the middle that we describe as financially coping. And then there's another big chunk who are financially vulnerable. And that financially vulnerable group is much bigger than the unbanked group. Um, and so what we've really been doing in the US over the last few years is trying to sort of merge these strands of thought of like, well, what's driving people to be financially healthy? And what's driving, what's the connection of financial services usage to that? Can you give and, us a quick definition of what you call financially vulnerable? Which is yeah, so, yeah, of course. So financial health in this case is being defined as the ability to um, weather ups and downs effectively in your financial life and the ability to plan um, optimistically for the future. <clears throat> and so when we talk about people who are financially vulnerable, Essentially, there's eight questions we've been using to identify the level of financial health. And if somebody's financially vulnerable, that means they do not have sufficient savings to be able to cover um, their spending for any meaningful time if they were to lose their job. They do not have the ability to plan ahead effectively and save for long-term objectives. They potentially have an unmanageable level of debt or they have insufficient levels of insurance. And so when you take all those features together, what you see is somebody who isn't necessarily able to pay all their bills on time or often having late payments, which um, is an indicator that somebody's not having a financially healthy experience day to day. So your biggest surprises were what? So, you know, the biggest surprise for folks, I think coming out of the diaries was um, in some ways similar to the, what happened when we looked at diaries in um, developing economies, which was the incredible complexity of people's financial lives and the incredible volatility of people's financial lives. So as an example, we um, got to know one family quite well, which was in some ways a typical American family, two working parents, three kids, but across their, the year that we gathered financial data about their lives, they had nine like nine independent sources of income, right? Two full-time jobs, multiple part-time jobs, tax refunds, tuition um, support from uh, student loans. So child support. So the complexity of that and the volatility that that creates in people's financial lives was really striking. Um, we have this sort of mental model of you have a job, it's a consistent, and you were referencing this, we have this mental model around consistent employment, consistent paychecks. And that drives a different way of thinking about financial planning than if you see the sort of level of volatility and unpredictability that goes with so many different income streams. So basically what you're saying is your biggest surprise is the level of complexity, volatility, and also the extreme sophistication of their sort of informal way of managing yeah. that, which is probably A, very sophisticated, but B, very expensive. Yeah. Um, I would have loved to have a number. I, you know, I saw um, we had a few of these reports floating around and then I never understood the methodology. So I never really dared quote them, but it was around and it's only for insurance, right? Obviously, so I'm biased, but it was sort of 
uh, low to to moderate to middle income households have very sophisticated risk management strategies informal but it costs them about 10 times more than insurance than taking out insurance so i didn't know if there was something out there uh, tj marie or, or or rachel that you've seen that kind of compares uh, informal management uh, linked to credit savings, payments, et cetera, compared to more formal, um, more formal uh, mechanisms. I don't know. There's not no, that. No, no, no. I, it's I, difficult, I, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't have, I, I don't have a data. I mean, a, a pure one figure that would summarize this, uh, this, this, this challenge, but, uh, but I, I think no, it's I much mean, more I, expensive. Yeah. Yeah. It's much more expensive for sure. So then that actually leads me to, so thank you very much, Rachel, and that leads me to a question, a great, it's a great segue to a question to you, Marie. Um, I mean, given what Rachel just described, uh, characterized this sort of uh, vulnerable from a financial point of view or financial inclusion point of view population in the US, um, France isn't exactly the same uh, as uh, uh, as the US, right, in terms of protection, in terms of, uh, well, I, I think we can safely say that it's much more of a welfare state. So uh, how would you compare uh, what, what Rachel just said with the, with the French situation? And I would still like to ask the half a second question, if you can answer it at the same time, um, which is that in a way you, you launched a business uh, where your population, where you're addressing people with, 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 with the difficulty, with their vulnerability or their pain point, which is being unbanked or underbanked in a country where most people were banked. And so sort of how did you do that and how did you find the way to improve their lives, even given this, what seemed in appearances, uh, you know, normal and good number from, a, from an inclusive point of view? Yeah, sure. No, I'm not sure I will uh, start comparing uh, France and the U.S. It will. Uh, I mean, I'm not an economist teacher and, and uh, or an historical teacher, or I don't know. But but uh, but there are many differences. There are also many uh, very strong common points, I think. And I actually really like uh, the, the the what you said, uh, Rachel, on the complexity and on the the changing. Let's say the 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 movement that is in um, vulnerable people's people's life. And those two uh, points are also very true in France. So of course, we're not in the same society. Of course, numbers are not the same. So the French population is, let's say, uh, uh, 67 million people. And we can say when we look at different numbers and we have uh, 4.5 million uh, fragile clients having a current account in the bank and the banks are um, having a, spe a special uh, policy towards them. So they have they are ceilings towards fees and they, are, uh, they have to support them handling their, their financial um, uh, life. But we also have more than uh, 9 million people below the poverty line. So, so we can say that even, we are, even if we are in a mature country, uh, we have, um, we have uh, more vulnerable people that, uh, that are very, uh, that, that are big numbers actually, when you look at the, the, the part they, they, they come for in the, in the population, the general population. And, uh, and so when we go back to those two points, I mean, the, how complex the financial uh, world can be and um, how uh, fast the life of people can change. Uh, it's really uh, bringing uh, actually um, a good um, good overview of why Nikkel is so successful in, in France, even though we have, if you look at the national bank statistics, we have maybe more than 86% of the people uh, having a current account in the country. So it's it's not a, you can say from a macroeconomic perspective that it's not a problem. Uh, but actually in the real, uh, in the life of people, uh, it's not so easy to handle uh, uh, to handle this financial life. It's not so easy, so easy it's not so cheap. Uh, and Nickel is based basically on digital from one side. So you mentioned that, Garrett, in your introduction. So digital is enabling us to be very cost effective in what we do, what we build, and very strong in the customer experience we, we provide. So it's very simple, very easy. But we are not only digital because we really want to reach everyone. Uh, and so we combine this digital uh, fintech with a physical network. And we, so we are um, having, we have agents uh, in the country 
that are point of sale, very local point of sale. So in France, there are tobacconists, but it could be uh, local shops in other countries because we are now uh, European. Uh, and um, and this uh, combination of um, of fintech, digital, very fast growing kind of technology enabling us to be cost effective and very um, straightforward and simple in terms of process and customer experience combined with a real um, point of sale is creating uh, the magic, I think, of the company and, and ex explaining the, the, the why actually Nickel is having in only uh, eight years already 2.8 million clients, even though everyone is saying that in France, everyone has an account and it's not a problem to get an account and, and blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's, um, it's very, uh, for me, it's still um, a surprise every day to see how fast we grow in the mature market where everyone is telling us that there is no issue and then everything is simple, everything is cheap and everything is very easy. So it should be the case for everyone. Um, I guess it's not really um, true and and uh, and somehow if I, if I just uh, complete um, what I've just said is that our clients come to us for one third, because they really don't want to hear from banks anymore, um, either because they were having overdebt or they were overdebt, sorry, or because uh, they were uh, they were feeling uncomfortable with this very um, traditional institution, and uh, they were not understanding the code, not the language, not the, so they don't want basically they just want a simple product they understand, and they don't want this financial institution being. Uh, handling their money. The second third of our clients are with us because it's a simple product and it's a very cheap. So if you look at France, for example, um, on average, uh, fees for having a current account are uh, around 215 um, uh, euros per year, which is quite expensive in um, uh, for the country. And uh, the 20% of the French people um, earning the less, the lower uh, revenues, they, they are paying more than 400 uh, euros per year. So it's quite expensive. And when, as soon as you, you understand how, as, much you, uh, as much you spend on this, then you want to decrease this price. And of course, so they can come to us because they, it's a very simple product and a very, very fair price. So they, they can save a lot of money uh, joining us. And uh, the last third of, of our clients are more maybe less um, in the topic of the panel, but our secondary accounts, like, uh, I don't know, more. If you want a second account because you want to buy things on the internet without using your main credit card, you can have a second account uh, with us and it's, you feel more secure um, and that's it. So I think in, in France, it's, it's um, it, it, those, those, those questions are very tricky because you don't see those questions when you look at macroeconomic, uh, the, uh, um, data, but when you go back to real life, you discover how how much the pain, uh, how high the pain can be, and how how people are struggling every day just to handle their financial uh, life, even if it's very simple when you think of it. So it's, uh, I think we we have very we have a lot of common points with the U.S. Of course, with what Rachel was uh, was sharing. Great, thank you very much, and it's a great uh, segue. I, I, I agree with you that we don't always expect points in common. Almost as much, I mean, I expect even less points of common between the US and a country like France than I do between <laughs> the mature and the emerging world, because uh, the models are so different. But actually, you just realize that uh, uh, if I had more time on this panel, I would give you lots of um, anecdotes that I've discovered, but it's true, it's, it's a constant... Uh, uh, reminder of how much actually people are in that kind of situation, whatever the level of development of their country is, which I think to me was one of the most surprising uh, factors. So I think it's a good uh, transition to you, TJ, mm. which of course yeah. I'm going to ask you about Asia, because if I asked you about Latin America, it would be weird. But <laughs> here it's more about obviously Japan. If you have a, you know, an overall uh, vision with regard to what's now uh, also known as mature Asia, as opposed to yeah, yeah. sort of emerging Asia. Um, and to, what I would really love to know is two things. Uh, one is a more general question, and maybe I'll ask it again to, 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 to Rachel and Marie uh, later on. But do you feel that in countries like Japan, 
uh, maybe Korea. I know you, you, you're you either part of oh, yeah, Korean. Oh, yeah, I'm a Korean. You know well, about yeah. your Korean. <laughs> yes. I don't want to make a mistake. <laughs> um, but you know a bit about Korea. Do you feel like financial inclusion and is is actually part of the policy or, or industry debates that are taking place at the governmental level, at the regulatory level, etc.? And uh, much like it's part of the developmental right uh, okay. debate, uh, but but more in more global institutions and and I would spe specifically like to understand what's how is it being considered from the point of view of, of a specific characteristic of, of of Japan and and let's say mature Asia, which is the the aging population. Um, so both the challenge of aging and the challenge of dependency. Which which creates a lot of exclusion. I would have I would have loved to hear from you on that. All right, thank you. Um, so let me very briefly explain the first poverty. So sixteen percent is the poverty ratio of Japan around, um, and it's tenth 16, highest. I'm not, you said sixteen. Sixteen one six, mm. and it's extremely high for uh, single parents family. Uh, the number is fifty percent five zero, and mostly single mother um, families. 50% are under poverty. There are three reasons. One, uh, so just gender disparity. To define poverty. What's how is this Japan defined? Yeah, pe poverty? yeah, people living below uh, median income level, which is um, in current rate, it's like fifteen thousand USD per year. Okay. Yeah. Do you know There's, what? Do you have any idea yeah, sure. what the median revenue is of the population in Japan? So median revenue is if you multiply this by two, so thirty thousand USD is a median level uh, revenue, wow. okay. so which is low. Uh, yeah, but, but still, uh, if that's your poverty level, okay. Yeah, and there are three reasons contributing to this uh, very high uh, single parent family uh, poverty. So number one is gender disparity. Um, uh, as you know, um, unfortunately, Japan is the worst among many rich countries in terms of gender parity. And the second is low liquidity in labor market. And the third is when, it's a little bit complex, but when parents get divorced, quite often parental rights go to mothers. And so let, let me give, give you a very quick example. So one, when men and when, uh, man and a uh, woman get married, quite often woman is underpaid, so they become housewives. And then they stop working and the men continue working and uh, you know and then earn money and the one when they get divorced because moms take look are looking after these kids they become you know now they continue to be a parent after the divorce but they've not been in uh, labor forces for so long and then in japan it's extremely difficult to go back to the labor market once you're you know, dormant for the time being, uh, for, for a while so that's contributing to the this uh, staggering high 50 percent um, the, the poverty ratio um, in uh, the, the um, single parent family. However, um, when it comes to financial inclusion, um, there are only two cases uh, in the last 30 years where financial inclusion became a um, policy debate. So um, by, by the way, Japan's account ownership percentage is 98%. So just 2% <laughs> you know, the uh, the two percent people don't have uh, financial access at all, and mo m many of them are homeless people or migrant workers who don't have uh, the proper registered address. One reason I think is that um, the banks are obliged to provide bank accounts for free, so there is no bank account maintenance fee in Japan. So it's for free. Uh, the, if you open a bank account, it's for free, and if you you know keep it dormant for a while, it's still free. So um, that is contributing to this the very high um, the financial access ratio in the country. But uh, there are two cases. Number one is this the um, loan sharks, uh, consumer loan sharks, uh, which became issue I think in around two thousand year uh, year two thousand. Two million people became um, bankrupt uh, due to this predatory lending activities. And then it became a big policy debate. And the government intervened. And as a result, many consumer lending companies went bankrupt. And uh, ironically, now they are under major banks of Japan. So Japanese banks acquired them. And then they are still running these commercial lending activities. 
uh, consumer lending activities, sorry. And uh, these consumer loans, um, gross loan portfolios soared during the time of COVID in the last two years. As you can imagine, the low-income households found it very difficult to make um, ends meet. So uh, they started to rely again on these consumer loans. So many people are again getting indebted these days. That, that's number one. And the number two, which is related to your question, uh, uh, which is the aging population. So many banks are now closed, closing their branches because they are not making money. And they're replacing many of the banking services with online, online ones, and which, is getting, uh, which are getting to be a troubles because many senior people don't know how to use a smartphone. And so for you know, young people, it's fine. Uh, they are using smartphone-based uh, banking apps. Uh, ba they're using banking apps by which they can use all the financial services. But for senior people, they need to go to bank branches, but sometimes their nearby branches were gone. So sometimes they need to travel a very long distance, uh, which is um, being a, a slight problem. Uh, it's not a serious, serious problem, but um, so there are only two cases that I can imagine. But it can only get worse, right? So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was reading that uh, it was an interesting fact that uh, people who are between 65 and 75 are less digitally savvy than people who are between 75 and 85 because the older <laughs> generation is being taught by its grandchildren, whereas the 65 to 75 don't really yet have grandchildren or they're too young to be teaching their grandparents. Maybe it's 60, 70 and 70 to 80, but it, I thought that was it. I wasn't expecting that my surprises that I was reading. Okay, so that thank you very much, uh, TJ, for that. And so if I, if I use this uh, to, to, to turn back to you, Rachel, and kind of go from assessment and overview and evaluation to actually action-oriented uh, sort of question and an action-oriented sort of question, uh, clearly your research, your financial diary research inspired um, uh, your, your, your the company you founded, Canary which, as you were saying, focuses on, on addressing the financial pain points of American workers and specifically American em employees, U.S. employees. Can you tell us a bit about how Canary works uh, and how employers can actually be consolidators or, or aggregators to, to offer more inclusive uh, financial services in just, a, in just a couple of minutes? Because all of you are too interesting and so we're, we're a little short on time. Especially if you have questions, which I didn't see yet. Yes, I will be quick. So in the U.S., um, really the primary way that we save for retirement or, or access health insurance is through our employers. And if you think about it, those are two like, really important financial services that help you manage big, long-term, far-off objectives. And as you look at how work has changed, um, the financial needs that people are, are struggling with are often closer in their nearer term financial objectives. So often people are just as worried about how they're gonna pay next month rent or mortgage as they are about how they're gonna save for retirement or more worried, frankly, about the near term issue. So I started Canary really um, as part of a whole, there's a whole movement of folks in the US who are bringing a wider range of financial services that help people to manage their near-term financial ups and downs into the employer, um, because that's a, a very typical way of, um, of people in the U.S. managing their financial lives. And so I, I no, start, I know Canary I is really, short, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, please. Yeah, so Canary, what we're doing is we're really aggregating grants. Um, one of the ways that people need help when they are experiencing some kind of a crisis is they just need access to more money. And so we're working with employers who are setting aside um, a pool of funds and the employer essentially makes a charitable donation to a nonprofit. And then if anybody who works for the employer experiences a financial crisis, they can come to that nonprofit and request help. And then if they meet the criteria, they can be given a financial transfer. And Canary, the for-profit, is a technology and service layer that makes all of that possible. And so, sorry, quick question, because I know I told you to be short, but this is quite, yeah, yeah. this is really a great, uh, 
it's well, I, I I love it because I we're starting to realize the extent to which, in particular, obviously, in mature markets, employees, sort of formal employees, but modest, blue collar, white collar, but modest, are, are actually in, in dire situations. Um, are you seeing a, sort of a push towards sort of trying to change behavior? And as you can imagine, uh, here I am thinking, you know, obviously, be more think more ahead, plan, save, et cetera. But here I'm actually even thinking from a health point of view, which is increasingly becoming a problem as we, you know, we're seeing sort of non, non-efficient primary healthcare across both types of, 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 of worlds, right? Mature and emerging and, and a lot of out of pocket. And that's actually very much the case in the US. Are you seeing something there where there's a, there can be a push on, on changing behaviors? Um. Yes and no. I mean, I think that we're, we saw the savings rate really go up during the um, pandemic, people, it, which was really the, an effect of the um, large cash transfers that the government shared as part of sustaining the economy and individuals. And, and, um, and, you know, so, but I don't think that was really about behavior so much. It was just about the result of like a massive um, shock, right? So, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that the there's a real move, a real desire to think that this is about behavior for people that when they have poor financial health, it's that something they could do differently. And that is true to some extent. I mean, but it's also the case that in the US, the cost of living has gone up significantly more than wages over the last several decades on an inflation adjusted basis. And so to not to, to think that that's not going to have impact on people is just you know doesn't make sense like of course people are more financially insecure um, do you have a number i mean why do i say this is that uh usually when we stick to a number to remember an idea do you have something where you would say ranges have gone up since say 2000 by this much whereas the cost of living by this much on an inflation adjusted basis or something we can all remember this by or not uh, i was just curious honestly. yeah I don't it's fine you know yeah, I don't have it on the top of my head, um, and it's really uh, well, because it's probably there, sector by sector, or yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, what's interesting, and this might be um, a global phenomenon. I don't know, but what we've seen is that the cost of the things that really matter for long-term financial stability, housing, education, healthcare, those things have gone up way more than the cost of living, whereas we've managed to, I'm sorry, way more than wages, whereas we have managed with economic policies that are focused on consumer spending to keep the cost of consumer goods lower, right? So in the US, the phenomenon is you can have a very, like a life that feels materially rich, right? You can have a flat screen TV, but you can be worried about paying your rent next week. Um, yeah, and that's, and that's, and that's and that, Right, and I think people want to see that paradox and think, oh, somebody um, uh, is making poor choices. They're choosing to spend on consumer goods instead of saving for their retirement. That's really not what's going on. What's going on is that consumer goods are really cheap and are easier to spend money on. Um, And housing has gotten really, really expensive. Yeah, I have to say, I saw housing prices recently in the U.S. It was quite surprising. (laughs) Yeah, they're Um, shocking. And shocking, yeah, that's true. Uh, Thank you very much. I think that sets the the ground for the type of, uh, what are your next steps, I guess, in terms of action orientation? (laughs) Um, Yeah. So, 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 so this does, I mean, when you, when you listen to Rachel, but even also Marie and, and TJ, there, I'm sure for a lot of people who are listening, it does echo uh, with a lot of things that 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 are also that also characterize the emerging world. Um, and so, TJ, I know that the title of this and the focus of this panel is about the mature world. But very quickly, I mean, the Gojo, the business you introduced in the beginning and that you that you founded, does span across mature and emerging Asia. Um, and so, I was wondering if you could tell us quickly about. Uh, your areas of focus and and sort of have you seen through your sort of Asian lens sort of learnings or commonalities or, or bridges to, 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 to Rachel's point between emerging and, and mature markets? Oh yeah, thank you. Um, so the, we started 
the company to make the private sector version of the World Bank providing financial services for everyone in developing countries. So uh, as a company, we are working in developing countries only. Uh, we have planned to go to Africa and Latin American countries. But um, yeah, that is it. Um, the, by the way, the Stuart Waterford, the one who started Financial Diaries project uh, is our, has been our uh, director for a long period. And we are running Financial Diaries project in many countries. And uh, we are also thinking- How do you know who to replace him with? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a problem. Um, but it's anyway- um, <laughs> It's the idea. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he's turning 80 shortly. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so, so the, the eternal aging problem, <laughs> which is not a oh, problem, yeah. I guess. But yeah. anyway, yeah, he's, so yeah, he's still very sharp. Um, and the so what I found is that so saving is anyway very essential anyway um, in any countries. However, the role of credit is very different, and then I, I would say credit is almost not helping to alleviate poverty, especially in a country like Japan, because low-income households in Japan have access to 0% interest rate loans from you know, government-backed facilities. Still, their poverty exists. So uh, I think the fundamental issue is that um, we don't have, we, don't, we haven't found a way to feed millions of people um, in a sustainable manner. And that, that is, I believe, the problem that we are all fa uh, we all are facing in the world. So, in you know, I, I mean, in, in one hand, I mean, uh, developing nations, right? And I know how ten thousand loans can transform people's lives um, dramatically. But that is not the case in Japan. Even if you have ten thousand loans with uh, zero interest, even earning money from there is not the easy game. Um, so. Um, th that is what I see, and I, I think eventually financial inclusion is meaningful to alleviate poverty only when it is combined with useful supports program, support programs, such as education, training, etc. And I believe that um, in which countries we really have to find a way to combine financial inclusion with some more support programs by which people can get out of poverty. And um, I'm looking for it. Uh, but still, I haven't found them. We, 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 maybe we can we, we, we'll start looking all of us with you. Oh yeah, <laughs> that we're all doing. Yeah, very much. Thank you, TJ. TJ, I think that's a. Uh, it's true that we often forget that it's a, it's part of an ecosystem. And and back to my point about digital, mm -hmm. that of course it's one of the key enablers to financial inclusion, but again to education inclusion and health inclusion and nutrition inclusion and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Marie, um, just to finish with you on a sort of more uh, a larger, uh, let's say, uh, a question, so to speak. And we all, because we all know that the biggest pain point, there are several pain points, lucky us in case we were worried about being bored. But the big one, the real big monster, so to speak, is, is, is last mile distribution, right? It's distribution and the, and the famous increasingly famous last mile or what maybe has become last sort of 20 meters. Um, Nikkel is a really unbelievable success. Uh, uh, honestly, I think when I think about Nikkel, I, 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 I can almost say you're going to blush, but I think it's almost like the, the M-Pesa of Europe in the sense that I think it hasn't been, it's, it's uncomparable and what you've done is is, is, is really amazing and I hope it's uh, it's scalable and that you're able to push it in lots of other countries. But so can you share some examples of what's worked and what hasn't from a distribution sort of last 100 meter point of view? And, and yeah. how do you see differences in that? Because you're also uh, going outside of France. So you're not going all the way to like uh, Eastern Europe, but I don't know if you have plans to do that, but you're going outside of France. Have you seen differences there? Uh, from from that particular pain point point of view, no, I'm uh, I'm uh, as fond as uh, as you of uh, Nikhil, so I'm I'm quite impressed as well. Uh, even if I'm be inside the company uh, of what we're building, because it's it's a it's just a, a model that is very strange. Actually, no one is copying it, even though we are very digital, very effective, we are profitable. 
but this uh, this combination combination of uh, of this digital asset with the physical network for the last mile distribution, as you say, is something that is quite unique actually. And it's not only because of the distribution and the last mile reaching the people, it's, it's everything is inside this network, basically. If I, this network of point of sale that are very local, independent point of sale inside the life of the, of the, French, uh, of the French people in France, the Spanish people in Spain, um, in the day-to-day -day life. So why is it so important to have this network uh, to build the success of Nikel? I think it's, it's uh, many things. First is for the brand. It's uh, totally different to build a financial product inside a local point of sale that look like any local point of sale. It's very different from doing, uh, doing that, from going in a bank uh, branch with all uh, that you can see in the back branch, with the people inside, with the word used inside. And so it's very easy to access, it's large open hour, it's everywhere in the country. So it's something that is very, very strong in the value proposition of the service we build. It's also very strong to accept the people because being there physically, it's not only for the non-digital um, client that we have actually, it's for everyone because, so in France, I said we are 67 million people and we have 10 million French people entering the tobacconist point of sale every day. So when you say that, it's not those 10 million people that would become nickel client, but it's them that will say to everyone, but you know that you can open a current account in five minutes in that shop. And then the word of mouth is very, very powerful because people are exchanging the good tricks and the good things to help their life. So it's something very, very good to build trust and to have a word of mouth effect very effective in the country. And so I totally, like you believe that this uh, distribution model and this last mile um, thing that is inside Nikel, it's, it's a very strong and unique asset that we are able to build. Um, and so maybe to finish, building it in other countries. So how does it look like? Actually, it's, uh, it's for us uh, quite easy. We, we take a lot of time to identify what would be the perfect point of sale in each country. So understanding the culture of the country, understanding the habits of the people. Okay, where do, where do they go every day to buy what? So it's not always tobacco, it could be lotto, it could be local shops, it could be some, some different point of sale. We are actually very keen in keeping, having independent point of sale, very local, very small. So it's not like uh, we, not, we don't do uh, business partnerships with very large scale uh, networks from other industries. We really go for those people, very local shopkeepers. And um, and for example, you were uh, asking me uh, what we are good at and maybe some, some, some failures we've made. We have inside the port hotel, we have a totem. So we have a, somewhere a physical asset where you can do your, say, uh, give your name, put your ID, give your phone, uh, phone number so we can do your uh, know your customer process. And then you can open the account. And this totem, we are always worrying, okay, do we really need this? physical uh, thing in the point of sale, or we don't really need it. So we've tried in a very, in some point of sale in some countries to remove it, saying, okay, it's too complex for us. And actually removing it is, um, is decreasing a lot, the activation of the point of sale, the, the fact that the, the shopkeeper is speaking about Nikkel, the fact that people are sharing ideas around Nikkel. And so having this asset inside the point of sale, is something very, very important, even though when you look at data, it's less than 10% of the subscriptions that are happening on this asset physically. The majority of the subscriptions are happening on smartphones, because even for people without smartphones, um, they kind of share the smartphone of a friend or the smartphone of an association, they find ways. But, so they don't always use this physical thing that we have inside the point of sale even though uh, removing it from the point of sale is uh, decreasing a lot the power and the activation of the point of sale in the model. So it's uh, one example of thing that uh, is very tricky to understand when it comes to last mile uh, distribution. It's both tricky, but when you describe it, it sounds quite simple. So it's this weird mix of, um, it's actually quite sophisticated thinking I find because it's, uh, as usual, the, the devil is in the detail. But then when you hear it, it sounds quite simple, which uh, probably is why it's, it's right. Um, 
I don't know if, are there any questions in the panel, Rima? I was wondering if, uh, I know you've posted a few things. So we have one question relating to the emerging world. Uh, so maybe more to you, TJ, um, regarding how to, how can we achieve financial inclusion objectives in countries with 70% of their economy being informal and cash-based? Uh, it's true that we've been talking a lot about digital, but it doesn't mean that digital, physical sorry, doesn't play a key role. I don't know if you want to take that one really quickly, because then there's another comment actually on what you said, TJ, regarding... Uh, an elder population that is less digital savvy and uh, somebody was saying that they were particularly interested in this what they've called well what you call the grandpa effect and they wanted to to know if you had a sources as to where they could find out more about this okay um so i i think many countries are anyway adapting um digital and uh, the cashless is becoming more popular for example, in India, um, you know, in, in our operation, you know, we work with traditional microfinance customers, but our cashless collection ratio is 95%, which is enormously higher than typical, uh, the market average, which is around 11%. Uh, the, I, I think the biggest hurdle I would say is literacy. So global, uh, the literacy level in developing countries is 70%. That means that 30% of the people don't read and write. When it comes to typical microfinance seg uh, customer segment, it's in my um, laugh, the estimate is like 60%. So 40% of the people don't write. And um, th that is the biggest challenge actually uh, to implement any cashless transaction because the people quite often talk about uh, smartphones, but if you don't read, you can't use them. It's very difficult. Some people are trying to come up with- uh, Pictograms you know, or images, right? Yeah, yeah. correct. But it's still- <laughs> There, there is still sounds. A long, long... There's lots of tidbits of yeah, sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there still is a long way to go. I have never um, observed any uh, super successful cases. So uh, we are still, still trying. However, in India, for example, we are using our customers' fingerprints to conduct um, the cashless transaction. So if our customers put their fingerprints, like debit card transaction, the repayment money is deducted from their bank accounts. So, yeah, but you can do that only because there's that hard, right? That's correct. <laughs> yeah, and, but um, we, are we are thinking of developing the similar systems in other countries because this UPI and the India stack is really a good way to um, extend financial inclusion. So, it's yeah, funny you should say that because what do you think of this? I was reading somewhere, but maybe mm -hmm. this is also relevant to the US and, and, and France, mm -hmm. that the new sort of binome ID and communication of information. So sort of the new binome is uh, the digital fingerprint. So the really the fingerprint, but this is true also in, in mature economies. And if the fingerprint is not there because in a lot of emerging markets, um, the more rural population no longer actually has fingerprints and this concerns more than three people. It actually concerns 7% of the people I was reading in India, for example, 4% of the people in Indonesia. So it's interesting. They use the eyes, right? The iris. So, but the binome is biometric ID, uh, which, you know, fights against fraud, etc., along with QR codes. And this is uh, going to be apparently the new sort of diabolical binome uh, for the future in terms of ID, fighting fraud and including people with a QR code approach that's very adapted to, are they illiterate? You know, even are they, do they, do they speak a specific dialogue, et cetera? So, so thanks for that, TJ. I have a, um, a quick question. So I have two quick questions, but we have two more minutes left. So one minute for Rachel, uh, which is about your distribution model that you're using for, for Canary, and then just for you to prepare, Marie. Um, is the French tobacco network unique? Or are there parallels in, in the other ge geographies? You touched upon that when you said you were looking for specific uh, contextual uh, uh, contextual uh, uh, networks in other countries. So just quite quickly, Rachel. Yeah, so I mean, the, these issues around distribution are less central to the work we're doing because we are working with people who are mostly employed. And so they are also mostly banked. Um, and so we're able to distribute cash to them Okay. Um, through PayPal, or, right? So we, those issues don't come up quite as much. Um, 
but they do still come that's up. Very clear. Yeah. I'm just saying that I think that's what people wanted to know. Thanks very much. That's yeah, very exactly. clear. It's going to hang up at 15.00 in 20 seconds. So Marie, very quickly. Yeah, no, the French Tabaconist Union is uh, quite unique, but you can find uh, this kind of potential in other countries. But we really, for example, in Spain, we partner with lotteries. In Germany, we partner with lotteries. In uh, Belgium, with press shops. So it really depends on the country, but at the end, it looks like any local point of shape at the corner of the street where you live. In. Thank you so much. So thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good night to all of three of you. I think we're on the dot. Thank you for this incredible panel. And I'm sure we'll thank all speak you. together to talk more about mature markets very soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you.